So it's been a long time since I've actually taken a look at any sort of keyboards and mice and stuff. I used to talk about that quite a bit on my channel, but it became difficult to do those types of videos because there's so much to talk about and it's all literally personal preference. The touch, the feel, the weight, the keycap type, the textures, the color, the pulling rate, the switches, the weight, all of them, like switch activation weight and all that stuff is all 100% personal preference. So I thought today what I would do is I would talk about uh, NZXT's new functional uh, or function two keyboard, but I'll take it as an opportunity to also explain what some of these specs mean regarding keyboards, because let's face it, it is the, with the exception of the mouse, it is the thing you interact with most on your entire setup. And if you have a shitty keyboard, it definitely takes away from the overall feel and experience of probably an otherwise great setup. So we're gonna talk about keyboards today and what the specs actually mean. NZXT's BLD is a quick and easy way to get a new gaming computer. Build a gaming PC on your budget using the built-in configurator, which now includes Intel's 14th gen CPUs featuring faster cores with increased core counts and speeds up to six gigahertz for an overall better gaming experience. Don't want to build it yourself? Then choose from BLD's pre-configured player PC systems built with performance and various budgets in mind. To see the full lineup and specs of the NZXT Build Player Series pre-built PCs, follow the sponsored link in the description below. So obviously a huge thanks to NZXT for sending us these keyboards to take a look at. Now we've been using the function keyboard, which is this guy right here, uh, since it came out, what, last year, the year before on our test bench. Uh, this was kind of like their first forte, if you will, in trying to make a quote unquote, I'm gonna say mid-range enthusiast type keyboard. The thing with keyboards is like, you've got your people like me that honestly just don't care. Like I am not that, I'm not a keyboard snob. I mean, I use a wireless Logitech G915 and people hate that keyboard, but I love it because it's wireless. And I like to sit there with my legs kicked up on the desk and have my keyboard on my lap watching YouTube and doing whatever. I don't type emails all day long. I'm not typing dissertations and crap. I don't care so much about how the keys and key switches feel. So I'm not exactly the perfect type of person to talk about keyboard enthusiast specs but I do use keyboards. So I am a average consumer that I think some of this information might actually mean something to a lot of people. So when it comes to key switch types, what they're referring to here is the actual button that you're pushing down to activate the button, whether that be the escape key, the A key, the space bar, shift, tilde, all those are being actuated by something. So a mechanical switch means that there's actually a little flipping spring in there that when is depressed, the spring trips and activates a, a circuit, a functional mechanical circuit to tell the keyboard computer inside, the PCB inside, to send a signal to the computer saying this key was pressed. Now, when it comes to the type of switches, we're talking about weight, it's always measured in grams, that's the actuation force, how much force is actually taken to push the key switch down. Then there's the travel. How far does the key have to move before it activates that switch? And then how far can it actually move after the switch is activated. So if you have a switch that moves down, let's say one and a half millimeters before the switch is activated, but it moves another one millimeter past that, or at that point, what, 66% extra travel past the actuation point, and you're trying to type fast and stuff, um, you might actually miss some keys or you might mistype or you know, double press sometimes on accident because you found that kind of a hover or bounce spot on the switch. And one of the biggest improvements they made on the function two over the function one is the fact that they ditched the mechanical key switch entirely for an optical switch. Now an optical switch basically is exactly like it sounds. Instead of having a little mechanical spring inside of the switch, it is actually a light beam that is an infrared light beam that is being sent across the switch that when you push the keycap down, the post actually breaks that beam. Now, the cool thing about the function two is the fact that that beam can be adjusted in cam between one millimeter or one and a half millimeters of actuation point. So depending on the actual key, you know, firmness, bo actually both of the function twos, the 10 keyless and the full size are uh, 40 gram switches. I almost said 40 milligram, that'd be like, blow on it and it goes. But anyway, they're 40 gram switches, which tends to be kind of like the accepted norm for most people across the keyboard community, that 40 grams is just right on the amount of activation. Now, sometimes people like to type lightly, which means maybe not bottom out the key, like Phil's an aggressive typer. Like when Phil writes an email or he's crap talking in Rocket League, it so that's what it sounds like to him. Now, he probably could get away with like an 80 gram switch and still be perfectly fine and be able to type and not get fatigue. Believe it or not, heavy key switches um, can lead to typing fatigue where you start to over time not fully depress that key all the way to be able to actuate the switch. So that's the nice thing about the optical switches is the fact that you can adjust that light 
to like one millimeter or a little bit heavier to 1.5 millimeters. Now you notice when I was pounding on it, you got all that sound of the key switch bottoming out. So as an example, this is that keyboard slash monitor combo thing that I found on Amazon that I did, did a video about. Um, it's got a mechanical key in here, mechanical switches and such, but they're pretty generic. So one, these are clicky keys, which means it has a, a tactile click, right? So you can hear that. But listen to the difference when it comes to bottoming out the key. So here is the one that has, at least the original function has a, uh, like I said, a foam layer on there to mute the key bottoming out. A little softer. Here's what it sounds like without it. So that's the only, that's what that means when it says it has a foam layer on there. Let's see, uh, basic stuff like 10 key list or 10 key, TKL just means it doesn't have a 10 key pad on there. Uh, I use a 10 key all the time. I always have to have a 10 key keyboard. So I, you'll never find me using a 10 key list. Uh, per key RGB lighting just means that each LED or each key inside the keyboard can be adjusted. That's an important feature to consider when buying a keyboard because sometimes you only get zone lighting, which means you might be able to change like a third of the keyboard at a time, or maybe the WASD is a zone, uh, or the F row might be a zone where they all have to be the same color. So per key is more expensive because of the fact that each that the software has to be able to support every single key having its own controlled lighting. The keycaps, so keycaps another thing. Um, most keycaps now use a Cherry MX style key. That's basically where you just have this little like plus in there that just mounts onto the post. Even though like keys caps may not be Cherry plus, like MX, these are not Cherry uh, switches in here at all. The original function actually has what's called Gatoron keys, which are basically like there's brands out there that are just building key switches that are like identical to Cherry MX, which makes them Cherry compatible when it comes to the keycaps. Now double shot keycap means that it's just the way that the plastic injection molding is. Uh, a little bit heavier keycap is kind of nice because you know that's the thing you're physically touching and interacting with. So when it comes to like, being a light, thin plastic, it feels cheap that way. Um, and then there's also shine through, which means that the actual RGB is shining through the keycap through a part that's not printed. So it's actually where the black is like masked off and then the letter shows through. Downside with that is the, if the quality of the keycap isn't very good, over time that can start to scratch and wear off and then your one starts to look like a because it's all scratched. So the nice thing about keycaps though is they can be changed and you can customize them and buy keycap replacements either OEM type replacements or go with a custom set of keycaps entirely, which a lot of people like to do. Um, I've kind of talked about what some of the differences were between the function one and the function two. I'm gonna go ahead and demonstrate some of the differences now uh, using the uh, 10 keyless here. Essentially, they're identical. The only difference between these two, as you can see, is one's an 80% or a 10 keyless. This one is a full keyboard, which has uh, the 10 key on there as well. One's white, one's black. Both have the shine through keycaps, double shot, uh, PPT keycaps. So the light shines through the keycap as well as radiates around the bottom of the key, which is nice. Um, they both have the same features of like the uh, volume adjustment knob on the side. You've got some lock switches, volume mute switches and such on the side of the keyboard. And then of course it uses cam, which I think might be a turnoff for a lot of people. But if you want to control the per key lighting and any of the macro functions and adjust the optical actuation point of one millimeter or one and a half millimeter, you're going to have to uh, download cam and use it. Now in the past, the function stuff keeps the stuff that you set it memory on the keyboard, which would be nice. So not to have cam running the entire time, but you are going to need cam to be able to adjust it. Also too, both keyboards are USB-C cable, which is nice because that means you're going to be able to use custom cables if you want, coiled cables or braided cables or anything that looks nice and matches your setup. You'll notice here it actually comes with four additional key types for uh, your WASD essentially, or technically anywhere you wanna put them. Sometimes people want a little bit extra you know, weight on the key or maybe a little bit lighter key. The only downside is because you only get four of them and I think they're intended for WASD, um, if you're typing, you might get some weird feeling if you're hitting some of those softer keys or heavier keys as you're typing. We also get our key switch puller because these are replaceable switches and that's the nice thing. Uh, when it comes to replaceable switches, that's a huge deal when it comes to a mechanical keyboard because if they're soldered in and one of the switches goes bad or starts to wear out or gets a little extra doingy, what I mean by doingy is like you might push a mechanical key and one of the key springs is wearing out. So it's like ka -doing, ka -doing, ka -doing, when, when you actuate it and it sounds really dumb, you could easily just pull the switch off and replace it. And to demonstrate that now, you just pull the cap, cap off. If it's a key that's in the middle of the keyboard that's harder to pull off, they do give you a little key cap puller. It's just a standard like cherry type puller. So you just push that down and it comes right out with it just like that. 
And then if we want to pull the switch out, we take this, go down on the side of the key switch, then we can just pull it straight up. Just like that. And then if this key switch were bad, now this is an optical switch. So it's important to note that if you actually look down in there, you'll notice the actual actuation, like infrared LEDs is down on the PCB, not in the switch. So the switch is really nothing more than a guide to guide your keycap. Yeah, everything's down inside the PCB. So this is just a carrier for the keycap. That's all it is. And then it's got the return spring built into it. So when you take out the switch, switch, on the function, this is actually not a switch at all. All it does is give you a carrier to put, have your keycap on so it can move up and down, obviously. And then it's kind of like a diffuser with the, the clear plastic to have your RGB shining up through it. But the actual actuation of the infrared LEDs is down on the PCB. And then what happens is you have this post that's sticking out the bottom of the switch. And as you push the, the actual post down to the spring, it blocks off this kind of a pass through where the light goes through that just blocks it off. So when it breaks the beam, that's how it knows that the switch was activated. So it's kind of neat. Um, if the infrared LED or something went bad on here, then that's it. It's part of the PCB. The whole keyboard would have to be changed. So that's sort of a downside when it comes to optical versus mechanical. A mechanical switch is all contained inside here. The pins, the whole deal just pushes down the PCB. So if this goes bad, you can replace it. But on an optical keyboard, Eh, it's a little bit more of a, of a risk. The only reason you could change, you would change the key switch, I'm using switch with quotations because it's, this is, looks like a switch, but it's not. It's just an actuator, um, is to change the feel of it. That'd be the only difference whatsoever. So the cable that comes with it, like I said, it's USB-A to USB-C. The nice thing about USB-A is it means it's gonna be compatible with more systems. Um, a lot of keyboards these days are coming USB-C on both sides, which is fine. Um, but having a USB-C cable, like I said, is nice because you can find a lot of companies out there making custom cables. These are paracord sleeved, so they already look very nice. Um, it's just, if you want to customize it with color or whatever, you can do that. Uh, let's talk about something else, build quality. So overall, the keyboard is pretty weighty, but the 10 keyless, is, the 10 keyless, I'd say 10 keyless, 10 keyless is about 1.58 pounds. So it's pretty light um, versus some of the other mechanical keyboards. One thing I want to point out though is this one has a double layer of foam under the key or sound dampening, dampening material, which is designed to make it sound a little bit less clacky. So this is the function two. And then this is the function one, just for comparison. And one of the reasons it sounds different too, it's not just the fact that it has double the amount of sound dampening on the bottoming out, because when the key hits the bottom of the stroke, it's got to hit something. And usually it's plastic on plastic, which gives you a very clanky, hollow feel to it. So by adding foam on the bottom of that, actually there was a very early mod people did with mechanical keyboards is they would get really thin O-rings and put those on the bottom of their keys and then the, you know, the O-ring would be what they bottomed out on. The problem is it took a long time to put those in and then the O-rings would sometimes break or they wear out. Uh, or sometimes it would stop the key from going down far enough. So trying to find just the right O-ring was a pain in the butt. Um, they've got that foam on there, but they went a step further by paying attention to the trends of what the enthusiast keyboard community is doing. And there was what was referred to as a tape mod. And a tape mod is, would be where uh, enthusiasts would take the keyboard, open it up, and on the entire back of the PCB, they would put like thick tape on it. And that's basically like a low pass filter, which was designed just to absorb some of the sound that was making its way through the PCB, because that's the direction the force was going. It would bottom out and then the sound would go through the PCB, kind of reverb within the chassis itself, maybe to your table, and then it would just be super noticeable. So that's one of the reasons why it sounds so different than the first function. Also too, the keys on here are a little bit more textured versus the original one. These are a little bit more smooth. These are a little bit more textured. The nice thing about the texture too is the fact that it's not gonna show as much skin oil or grease. I don't know what else to call it. Like skin oils are, it's nasty, right? It starts to get all over your keyboard. In fact, you can see that with our um, test bench keyboard, which we've been using for a while. A lot of the keys are smooth and then we start to get shiny spots because by typing on them, you start to polish them. Now the textured keys will do that too, but it takes a lot longer for that to happen. Um, but one other thing too, we talk about the actual functionality of the keyboard is one of the major differences between this being a mechanical keyboard or an optical keyboard, and this applies to, to any mechanical versus optical, is typical gaming keyboards that are mechanical keys have a 1000 hertz polling rate. What that means is the PCB built into this is polling and checking for a key press 1000 times every second. 
With the optical switch, they're able to pull 8,000 times every second. So all that means is just that if you're, if you happen to have a key press at just the right moment when you're lifting up another key, that you won't get a missed key press. Uh, the nice thing about optical switches too, it's, it's, very un, it's very unlikely to get what's called bounce. If you've ever been typing on a mechanical keyboard on cheaper, more generic keys, you might notice sometimes you push a button and it might, you might get three or four Fs, just bleep, it comes across. It's like paintballing. If you've ever been paintballing, bouncing the switch was actually a way to cheat when it came to being semi-automatic. You could find the spot and they were actually a little stop posts that you had on the trigger, the little set screw that you can make it so that if you held it just right, the vibration of the gun shooting would actually cause the switch inside to bounce. So you would get almost like a full auto or like a bump stop, if you would, on a paintball gun. The same thing can happen on a mechanical keyboard. So sometimes you could be typing and you might get multiple key presses because a, a mechanical switch might be starting to go out, which means the spring is starting to bounce against that connection, which gives you multiple key presses. Optical is very unlikely to do that. So. The other thing to really consider uh, when it comes to keyboards is really gonna be just the size. So you're gonna find like 10 keyless, which is like 80, which means it's 80%, it's like 80% the width of a normal keyboard. You can go all the way down to like 65% where the keys are even closer. They might emit like the insert and page buttons and even maybe the arrow keys entirely. Sometimes you'll get them where the keys are even closer together than standard. I can't type on those. I've got too big of fingers and so I'm constantly bumping the wrong keys and stuff. But you know what? I think when it comes to mechanical keyboard versus optical, this is the second optical keyboard I've ever typed on. Um, well, I haven't typed on this yet personally. Right now, this is more of a video about talking about the specs and things to consider. I have typed on optical keyboards in the past. They're actually very, very nice, only in the sense that you can sort of adjust that actuation point, which is really nice. You can't do that with mechanical. With mechanical, where it is is where it is, and that's it. And you get, like I said, about what, 33% of adjustability when it comes to actuation point, 1.5 millimeters versus one millimeter. I think me personally would probably leave it at one millimeter. I tend to be the kind of person that sometimes doesn't press the key down all the way. So having a, a sooner actuation on that would be really nice. Anyway, I, it's been a long time since I've talked about peripherals. I wanna put this video out there and see how you guys sort of respond to it. Um, with uh, the new Function 2 keyboard coming out, we've been using the Function 1, I'm gonna call it the Function 1 now, since the day they came out, uh, I think almost two years ago or somewhere around there. It's been a solid keyboard, haven't had any complaints about it, haven't had, I, we have not been running NZXT Cam with it, to be honest, we've just used it out of the box as is. I love the volume knob on the side. Um, we've also got the three switches right here on the side, um, which are just convenient, they're out of the way, you're not bumping them and such. The only downside about uh, when it comes to doing macros and stuff on a keyboard like this that doesn't have actual macro rows is the fact that you're dealing with key combinations to do macros. So it might be a little bit more tedious versus having like an M row. They refer to macros usually as M rows on other keyboards. I'd like to see that implemented. And then I think we would start to see NZXT become a real player uh, and real competitor when it comes to ga gaining more of an enthusiast following. But it's nice to see that they've actually been paying attention to the trends people have been doing for custom keyboard building and keyboard mods and trying to implement them into keyboards uh, that you can just go and buy and be up and running instantly. Like I said, adjustable keys on here when it comes to being able to switch out at least a couple of the switches for different uh, weights that are gonna be, I'm assuming WASD since there's four of them. RGB if you want it. Um, obviously you can turn it off if you don't want it. You know, replaceable keycaps because they use just Cherry MX style keycaps, which is nice to see. So, you know, there it is right there. It looks like every other Cherry. Nice weighty keyboard with lots of rubber on the bottom. So you're not gonna be sliding all around the desk if you're kind of an aggressive gamer. And then we haven't had any of them go bad or any keys start to fail on us. So it's nice to see. In terms of pricing, the 10 keyless is $129 and the 10 key is $139. So we're talking a $10 difference, and it puts them right into the category of pricing with like Corsair and Asus and Razer and all the other brands. In fact, a lot of those keyboards are 200 plus dollars. Uh, and then let's not get me started on the fact that my like G915 Logitech wireless was like $300. So not a bad price if you compare it. All right, guys, thanks for watching. Sound off down below if you'd like to see us do a little bit more in-depth information about what specs and stuff mean when it comes to gaming keyboards or mice or headsets. Maybe we'll consider doing more of those in the future. Thanks for watching guys, and as always, we'll see you in the next one.